Good morning, everybody. What a beautiful, sunny morning it is. And I just greet you in the name of Jesus. It's an absolute privilege to be gathering like this, although apart, but together. As we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, where we are going to just allow some of the lyric videos that we watch cause our hearts to hopefully want to respond in song and singing. And also we're going to worship in giving. I want to read from the book of John, 1 John the first five verses in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. This morning, wherever you are, we're gathering to worship Jesus. Let's do that together. And we are very mindful that there is so much darkness in this world. There's so much darkness in our own communities our nation, the nations of the world, because of sin that's in the human heart. This reading reminds us that Jesus has always been, and He is, and He is the light that overcomes the darkness. What do we need to do this morning, friends, is simply come with a posture of surrender and leaning into Christ 
this morning. Let His glory be the light that lights up our hearts. And let us be the hands and feet of Christ that take His light into this world. And so let's pray together this morning. God, be glorified through these songs, through our act of giving, through the receiving of the preaching of the word, our response to that. Be glorified today. May the oldest to the youngest who's watching and listening right now be drawn to who you are. For you are the light of the world. Be magnified, Jesus. Amen. Let's worship together now.
at Glen Eden Church, we know that our worship is not just song and music. It's a response of all we have to God. And as part of our worship, when we gather, we also give to the Lord. And I want to read to you this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Here Paul is exhorting the church to continue the grace of giving. And in him exhorting the church, he comes to this profound summary in verse 6. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. It seems like a real link between the heart of generosity and the joy of us doing work for God. And so, so many in the life of the church during this lockdown time have been giving, giving to the needs of others. We've seen incredible provisions from food parcels, vouchers, a vegetable drop-offs, some school fees covered even, just an incredible measure of joyful giving unto God. And so churches, we do that as worship this morning. As we respond in sending our regular gift to the local church, Glenian Church. We do it in joy and we ask God that He would abound grace in our hearts, that we may thrive in every good work He's called us to. Good morning, church. I'm going to be reading from Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 to 7. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Wow. Thank you, God, that there's nothing we can do to earn your love. We are only holy because of you, Christ. Let our hearts be softened and humbled as we listen to the word now. To speak to us, God, we want to be shaped to be more like you. Thank you, God. Amen. Thanks, Joe. Good morning, friends. I'm really grateful to be able to um, have a bit of time to share with you this morning from God's Word. We're continuing in the letter to Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. Before we get into it, I just want to acknowledge it and just, just say thank you to Nathan, to, to Joe, to just all that they do for us as a local church every week, just preparing these online gatherings. We we so appreciate you guys. We love you guys. I um, mean, just know we, we're so grateful for all the effort you put into. So thank you. So Nate, last week, he laid a beautiful foundation for us from this chapter, uh, looking at verse 1 and just, just speaking of uh, the call that Paul is issuing to for us to be a people who rejoice in God. And this morning, we're going to see how Paul um, starts to get very real and vulnerable with this church. I'm sure you've seen by now, Paul is jealous for their joy. He's jealous for this to be a, a people 
who are so secure and at the same time so satisfied in Jesus. So this morning we're going to look at this passage and see how Paul continues working that out. I'm just going to read it for us again. I'm going to read actually from verse 1 to just after verse 8 and then we're going to get into it. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Because we are the circumcision. We are those who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. We don't put any confidence in our flesh, in ourselves. So I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. Of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had from any of that stuff, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Let me pray for us, friends. God, I, Lord, I come humbly before this passage this morning, God. I come before you, Lord, inadequate, Lord, to do justice to this passage. And so I pray that you will help me now, that you will anoint me now, Holy Spirit. I pray that you will help me, Lord, to speak your truth in love, God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that every heart will be open to receive this morning your word, that your word will be as a as a razor-sharp knife, Lord, that cuts through and discerns every one of our thoughts and our intentions, God. Lord, I pray this morning, God, that you will expose, that you will comfort, that you will disturb, that you will assure, that you will shake up, God, that you will change us, God, that you will set our direction and our vision Godward, that we will behold you, God, this morning in the face of Jesus Christ, God, I pray that you will help me now, Lord. Help us now, Lord, to receive all that you want to give us, Lord, through this word. Amen. Amen. So verse 2, we see Paul pens the phrase, look out, three times. Look out, look out, look out. What we see is that there's some strong language here, and, and obviously it's because he's issuing a warning to them. A warning against who? He's warning them against the dogs. Look out for these dogs. He's not referencing here our pets. He was talking about people. Look out for these dogs. Look out for these evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. You see, for Paul, this, uh, this language was so strong because this was so serious for him, what he was warning them against. But this language is harsh. I mean, when were you last in a connect group, or maybe it was last week, <laughs> where you were warned against well, you were warned to watch out for these dogs and these evildoers. I can tell you, I wouldn't recommend you trying to do that over a Zoom uh, chat where everything keeps breaking up. It could get a, a bit awkward. But you see, these, these Jews, they, they, this language is harsh because these guys, they were just simply saying to the Christian believers, guys, you, you're trusting Jesus, that's great. But you've got to make sure that you're also following every Old Testament law and that you're also physically circumcised, because that was the sign God gave us to show us that we belong to God. I mean, the Old Testament laws are good. Circumcision is not in and of itself bad. You see, Paul wasn't so much going after the act. He was, he was ruthlessly going after the motive or the reason for what they were promoting. See, these guys were saying to Paul, friends, that for you to be a real Christian, for you to be really assured of your salvation. For you to come to that place of really right standing with God. And therefore to have the joy in God and the promises of God and the glory of God. You needed to, to add something to what God had done. Friends, essentially what they were saying was, or what they were doing by promoting this legalism and, and all this extra stuff. They were demeaning the very act of Christ on the cross. That's why this was so serious. That's why Paul's language was so harsh. They were essentially saying that what Christ did on the cross was inadequate. 
that God himself was inadequate to save us fully and completely and inadequate to keep us. Watch out for these less than human men, Paul was saying. These, these dogs who, who with their animal-like behavior are trying to get you to return to the vomit of your self-righteousness. Watch out for these, these promoters of this evil. Whether they are showing or trying to show that Christ is actually inadequate. Watch out for these men who are, who are actually putting confidence in what they can do and produce more than in what God has done. They were attacking the heart of the gospel. They were attacking the assurance in Christ. And so Paul, in, in one verse, he utterly shames him. And then he brings it back to, to his friends, to the church. So he said, Warner, watch out. Look out for these dogs, these evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For, or, or because... Because we are the circumcision. What you're saying is watch out for them because we are not like them. We are those who, who don't have to circumcise ourselves on the outside because God in Christ has circumcised our hearts. God has cut through our hearts. He has changed us. We are those who now worship. Who worship God by the Spirit of God. God is with us. That's who we are. We are those who have God present with us. That's our guarantee. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as our guarantee to stand before God and to live out every day assured that we are right with God, safe with God, securing God. We are those who glory in Jesus Christ. We glory in what Christ has done. He's finished work on the cross and not in anything we have done or anything we will do. This is who we are. We are those who put no confidence in what we can produce. For all of our confidence and our joy and our satisfaction and our assurance and our delight is in Jesus Christ alone. That's who we are. We are not like them. So watch out for them, church, because what they are promoting, what Paul was saying, is dangerous. You see, Paul knew... He knew all too well the appeal of what they were promoting. He himself knew it all too well. He knew so much of human nature. You and I know it all too well. The appeal of just, okay, so there's something I must do. There's something for, for me to do. Okay, great. That's actually helpful. That's actually helpful because at least now, if I do this, this, and that, if I tick this box, if I follow this formula, then actually I can really be assured Paul knew the, the temptation, and this is why his warning was so serious. And this is why I believe our, our first point, what I see from this text this morning, friends, our first point is this, don't ever add anything to this gospel. Church, don't ever add anything to the gospel of God concerning Jesus Christ. Don't ever add anything to Jesus Christ. Not now, not ever. Don't add anything to try and make you feel assured or right with God. That's what Paul was saying to them. No, when you're struggling with these things, go to Jesus again. Go and see what God says about you. Go, go, go and remind yourself. Go and let the Holy Spirit testify to your spirit that you're children of God because of what Christ has done. Don't you dare, Paul was saying, add anything to this. Watch out for those who are trying to promote this kind of more that is needed. But also watch out for yourself. Watch out for yourself, church. Paul knew how serious this was. And you can feel the intensity of the language in, in these two verses as he's been going after it. Watch out. Watch out. We are not like them. And then it seems as he, as he goes into verse 4, the sense I, I got from this was that there was this pause moment. I don't know if you see that there. There's this pause. He's, he's been saying, watch out, because we are not like them. And then it's as if he sits back for a moment. And sort of draws forward again and carries on writing. He says, you know what, actually, you know what, actually, if you want to talk about someone who, who could maybe have some confidence before God in what they have done, that, that, could, that could be me. Let me tell you about myself. And the poor, he starts unpacking one serious CV, one impressive CV. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. 
who was the foreigner. He was a fully fledged Jew, a true Israelite, a true Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was an ethnic, purebred Israelite who came from the line, the line of Abraham. He was part of God's chosen people, ran through his veins. As to the law, oh, he was a Pharisee. Now these guys are hard to, to hold them, hold anything up to them because they followed the rules, the laws so strictly. They were ruthless. Nothing stood in their way. Oh, their hearts were so from, far from God, but they were ruthless. And Paul said, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, as to my passion for the things of God, even though he missed it, for the things of God, well, I persecuted the church. I persecuted, I dealt with this threat of these Christ followers. I dealt with them ruthlessly. I put them in prison. I, I approved of their murder. That's how passionate I was. And as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Now Paul knew he was a sinner. But you're saying he ticked every box. On the outside, he looked like a man who had ticked every box. So for us today, friends, what, what would this look like? What are some of these things that we might hold up as our CVs? Could be the quiet times that you have, the disciplines that you have in place. That you haven't missed a, a church meeting or in these days an online meeting in a, forever. You've never missed one. Come rain or, or sun, come sickness or you there. Could be that you devour Christian books, that you've been through every commentary. You could be through, it could be your family name. It could be that you come from this great lineage. You could be sitting there as a, as a teenager or a child and you sort of are, are sitting there proud because you look and your, your dad's a pastor and that was a pastor and you're part of this whole missionary. I've heard of these families where it's eight generations down of missionaries and that's where you start saying, that's my CV. That's, that's my, or maybe you were part of a Christian school. They said the Lord's Prayer every day. And you, you kind of say, well, well, obviously that must have meant something. You see, even in and of itself, it's not that these things are bad. But they are dangerous, friends, when they start being held up against the gospel of God and we start finding a false sense of assurance. They hold up an illusion. And they can actually start drawing us further away from God than closer towards Him. And that's what Paul knew. That's why he knew this was so dangerous. That's why he chose to start exposing himself now. He started making himself so vulnerable. Imagine how it was for him to write in a letter that, that he didn't even know who would be reading this, but he knew it would be Christ followers. And uh, to, to share again, to bring to their remembrance again, and maybe even some who didn't know, that he, he used to hate Christ and hated God's people. He was being real and vulnerable with them, friends. And this is now where he starts bringing it back to Christ. He starts, he starts holding up Christ against himself he starts holding up the cross against everything he has done and in, in verse 7 he says you know what this is my cv these are all the things that i've done but but are the glorious buts of the word a eh? but whatever gain i had from all of these things whatever reputation and prestige and power and assurance they would have brought to me whatever gain i had from them i counted as loss for the sake of gaining christ all of them were in my gain column they were my post, they were my badge of honor, they were my glory, they were my confidence, they were my self-worth. I've thrown it all out, they're all lost now, they're all in the lost column. And it's just Christ now. He goes on to say, indeed, in verse 8, actually, I count everything as loss. All that I've done now as a believer, I keep throwing it into the lost column. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. When compared to Christ, yes, in and of themselves... They, there's value there and they're good in how they serve and promote the gospel and all that. But in terms of for me, no, they, they are not my value. They don't give me my self-worth. They are not my identity before God. They are not what I'm going to hold up to God. No, it's Christ. It's Jesus. That's who I hold up before God. It's Jesus. That's where my confidence is and my self-worth. Paul didn't count everything lost of his past and then say, okay, now I'm going to start again. I'm starting afresh now. So now I'm a believer right now. What should I do here? That's what I used to do as a Jew. What should I do? Okay, I need to preach. Okay, well, yo, who's the most hardcore? You're missionary, okay? I want you to do that. Oh, I, want you, I want you to suffer. I want you to be what for Christ. Okay, that's the most hardcore stuff. He didn't start building up his CV again, friends. He kept counting it all loss for the sake of gaining Christ. So friends, if our first point from this passage is don't ever add anything to this gospel, 
I believe our second point is this. Jesus is always enough. Don't ever add anything to this gospel, friends. That's what he was warning them against. Don't ever add anything to this gospel. Not now, not ever. Because Jesus is always enough. He's enough to have dealt with your past. He's enough to keep you in the present, to assure you, to satisfy you, to give you joy, to overwhelm you with his love. And he's enough to bring you into future glory. Jesus is always enough. You're not trying to add anything to the work or person of Christ. Trying to, trying to add something to Jesus is like. It's maybe like going to a three-star Michelin restaurant. I don't know if any of you guys have been. I've, I've never been to one, but I've watched shows about it and I've read a bit about it. These are the best restaurants in the world. Three stars. These are the best restaurants in the world. The chefs spend months creating these meals. And the, the meat and the, the food, the produce is of the, the most delicacy. It's, it's the ultimate meal. Most expensive, the ultimate. So you arrive there now. And you arrive and, and you sit down at your table and you... Kind of make yourself comfortable. When the chef comes out, he's bringing you the dish himself. And he's been weeks planning this. And he lays it there and the waiters are all there and everything is just perfectly laid out. And the, the aromas are wafting and it looks magnificent. And you look at it and they're all sort of smiling at you and you look at it and kind of give a bit of an awkward smile. And they notice that you're starting to kind of keep eye contact but you're grabbing for something down there. And, and they're looking and you bring out a Tupperware dish. And they kind of still kind of keeping, and you take a spoon and you still, ah, oh, it looks great. And you start spooning some mac and cheese, some homemade mac and cheese. And you start mixing it in your plate. And went, what are you doing? What are you doing? I just, I don't think it's going to satisfy me. I thought I just needed to add some of my own, my own self to this meal. I just need to improve on it a bit. It's like walking into an art gallery. And everyone is marveling at a beautiful, magnificent piece of art like the Mona Lisa. And they're looking at it. And then they're taking note of the brush stroke and the detail and the thought behind it. And it's just beautiful. Some have been there for hours. And you walk up and you, you take a paintbrush out your back pocket and some two hands, some paint. And you walk up to it, you have a look at it. And you just add some brush strokes. And what do you... It's like, no, I thought I could improve of the work. Don't you think it looks a bit better? It's like sitting in a concert hall and you're listening to... Mozart, the Mozart symphony, and everyone, their eyes are closed, it's crescendoing, and it's just getting, it's amazing, it's just you, people are getting lost in it. And then some oak walks down to the front of the piano, and he just starts banging out some notes. He said, wait, he says, no, it's going to sound better. Now friends, all these illustrations, they fall short and they seem crazy, they, they sound more probably like a, a Mr. Bean show. But that's the point! That's the point! We wouldn't fathom as a human race. We wouldn't fathom to add anything to our so prized works of art. We wouldn't fathom the idea of adding anything to, to a dish like, the, like what I was talking about. We wouldn't fathom adding anything to a masterful Mozart symphony. No, we would protect these things even at the cost of human life. We wouldn't fathom the idea of everything. Yet every day, the human race and even us as believers... We consider and we even try to add something to the finished work of God in Christ. We add something to Jesus thinking that he's not really adequate or sufficient enough. Thinking that he can't really satisfy us. Friends, are, are we mad? We can't add anything. Jesus is always enough. And that was the encouragement, friends. Jesus is always enough. He's enough for you. Today, tomorrow and forever. He's enough to save you. If you're sinning there and you think, you don't know how bad I am. Paul was the worst of sinners. That's what he told Timothy. I'm the worst of men. That's what he told Timothy. I'm actually the worst of men. Paul was a sinner himself, friends. He said, I'm the worst of men. So if you sin there and you think, you know, I'm, I, just, uh, I, need, I need to improve on myself before I can even approach God. He said, don't even start trying. You can't. Our very natures are against God. But Jesus is sufficient for you, my friend. He's enough for you. Or maybe you're like me, where I was so desperate to 
to live and look like these great men of faith, these Pauls of the word. So I would listen so carefully and I would read so closely. So, oh, they're having, they have a two-hour quiet time. And then I would go and have two-hour quiet time. Oh, they, they're suffering, they're doing this. I wanted to, please God, send me to somewhere where I'll be killed for my faith. Because obviously that is like the pinnacle of being a follower of Christ. And all these things that I try to produce and manufacture. You know what, friends? I missed it. Because that's not what they were doing. I just saw their works, but I didn't see their treasure. I didn't see what they valued most. I I didn't see the, the place, the heart from where all of it flowed. They didn't suffer for Christ. They didn't labor hard. They didn't, they didn't spend time in God's word because they were trying to make themselves more right with God or trying to build up their CV. It's because they just were so in love with Jesus. They just treasured and valued Jesus above all else. That there was nothing else that they could do. They just had to proclaim him and go and give and share and love. Just there was no other response for them. And it was God working it out in them. And I missed that, friends. So you're trying to save yourself or, or prove your own worth even is like it's like spending your days collecting what you think are, what you think may be diamonds. And you and you you are going around and and you're collecting all these things and it's your works. And even as a believer, you you think and people are looking at you and say, Oh, have you seen Phil? Have you seen how much time he spends with God? Have you seen uh, have you heard his preach? Have you have you seen this? Have you and, and you you start finding that starts becoming your badge of honor. And one day you come face to face with God and you, you, you actually, you're not even thinking about Christ anymore. And you come up before God and you make direct eye contact with Him because you have this false sense of assurance. And God looks at you and He looks down and you follow His eyes down. And you look and suddenly you step back. And you realize that on earth all it was was the sun was just shining through, making it look like diamonds, but actually you're just holding dirty plastic. And you're left standing before the God of the universe with nothing but rubbish in your hands. Friends, that's why Paul moved everything to the lost column. Because Paul found that which was of most infinite and eternal value. God's not asking us to go after less. He, he's saying, stop coming to me with your breadcrumbs and come and feast on my grace and my mercy and my compassion and to receive from me my power to enable you and to work through you. Come and come before me. Come and value me. When compared to Christ, everything pales. Everything pales, friends. Paul lost himself. If you have read others of Paul's letters and you just look closely at his language. He was a man who who lost himself. Do you know that he never ever gained that same self-confidence that he had as a a Jew pre-Christ? He never gained that same sort of sense of self-worth or self-image or boasting. No, because he didn't start building up his CV again as a believer. No, he, he actually said things like, I'm so weak, I'm so weak, but God's grace is sufficient for me. I can't do this. I I struggle. But it's Christ working in me. His purposes. Paul was a desperate, broken man before God. And God just continued to flood him with his love and his grace and his mercy. And Paul just received it day after day after day. Never trying to add anything to this gospel. Because Jesus for him was always enough. And that's what he was encouraging this church. That's what we are being encouraged to today, friends. Our church, we need to take the warning this morning that Paul is issuing here. But at the same time, take the massive encouragement that Jesus is always enough. We are not like them. We, we don't have to be those who are trying to manufacture something to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. Jesus is always enough. You see, so many of us, we respect, we honor, we are grateful to Jesus. We pay lip service to him with our songs. And with our words. But our hearts are so far from God. The issue is that we don't really value Christ. And all the things that we are doing is us just sort of trying to desperately make ourselves seem better than Christ. 
it's important that we do also consider then where do these good works come in? I'd written here a note, always, uh, we need to always answer the questions that, that may come to our mind. I think one of the questions that may have been coming out to you as I've been preaching is, I thought, where do quiet times come in? You know, where do these things fit in? Where, where do uh, mission work and church planting and all these type of things, where do they fit in? Because in and of themselves, they, they are good and they are needed and they, how God is working, gifts that God gives. And so friend, I'll ask you, well, what's your motive for doing them? That's the question. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. What's your motive behind you spending time with God? Do you read the Bible because you think that that is what a good Christian should do? Or because you've been told that what you need to do? Or because you just are so in love with Jesus Christ that you are so desperate to know him more? Because you, you, you've beheld him and you just you need to know more for your soul. You know that nothing else will satisfy you. Huh? Like living on stale bread and then having one incredible feast of a meal. And to go back to that stale bread is just, you can't because you know that there is something else that satisfies. And so you keep going to God in his word because he's the only one that satisfies you. Or do, do you try and share Christ or do you go on these mission trips or whatever because... It, it, that's, that's what being a good Christian is. That's, that's what you've been told or led to believe that that's, that will show Christian maturity. So you sort of pull up yourself by your bootstraps and say, I've got to do this. Or is it because you just, you know, is there opportunity here for me to proclaim Christ? Whether it's sending a WhatsApp note, whether it's taking an opportunity to, to preach his word, whether it's going on a trip because Jesus is so real to me that he is the only hope for you. And I just, I need to tell him about it. I need to tell you about him. Because you're suffering and he's the only one who will really comfort you. Because you're so lost in your sin, he's the only one who can actually bring you out. Because you believe that Jesus is always enough. That's what we need to consider, friends. What's our motive? You know, so often as church leaders and, and, and churches I've been a part of, and even I've fallen prey to it, so often, even promoted at the time, is that we start on the, on the wrong end. We start with the functions and we start with the activities and we start with the works. Instead of, instead of coming before people and just saying, you know what, let, let me just get to know you and just really, let's deal with the pertinent issues. We say, well, what gifts do you think you have? No, I, I enjoy worship. I play guitar. Okay, cool. Well, let's get you into the guitar. Great. So you sorted your probably little team there. Or, or, or what are you doing here? Or how do you do that? And we just try and get people into it. In fact, you know, I know the heart behind it, friends. But we've got to start asking each other. Do you value Christ? Do you value Christ? Have you even thought of Jesus like that? Do you treasure Jesus above all else? You know, if I'd been asked that question... Ten years ago, I just said, now I value ministry, actually. Now I, I want to be a preacher, actually. Because you see, for me, from when I was a, a boy even, just Jesus was so important. And he seemed to be the most important person uh, out there. And he, he spoke a truth that seemed to be absolute. And so for me, I thought, man, I want to speak about that which is the most important thing, I want to speak, uh, I want to declare a truth that is outside of humanity. That, wouldn't that be amazing? I value preaching and talking about him more than I value Jesus the person. And friends, I wish someone would have said to me years ago, before they asked me, well, what do you giftings do you feel you have? Or, or, or what talents do you think you have? Or where do you think you could fit into this church? Or how do you think you could get involved? Or how do you think you serve? Imagine they took me and said, Phil, do you value Christ above any other works? Put that aside. What is your gain? What is your gain? Where do you find yourself worth? Now my God is so faithful because he did that through his word. He shattered me. And he broke me. And he exposed me. And just as I sat in his word. And he helped me see. And he helped me start to see Jesus. And friends, this is where we need to start this morning. And it's okay if some of you are feeling uncomfortable. Some of you are feeling like just, am I even saved? That's, it's okay. Ask the question. Ask the question. 
Because friend, I don't want you to be like those whom Jesus is when he comes back. They say, Jesus, I'm here. Jesus. Look at the works I did. Look at the miracles I did. Good things. Remember, good things in and of themselves. Those miracles were helping some people. But this person, he had taken it on himself as his badge of honor, as his glory, as his treasure, as his delight. Jesus will say to him, I don't know you. Get away from me. I don't know you. And in that moment, you'll realize, I never knew Jesus. I don't know Jesus either. Friend, you got to get to know Jesus this morning. That's where we got to start this morning. Who do you value? You know, pastors are classified in essential services now. Beautiful. So ask Nathan or Graham or the other elders or your life group leaders or even as a close friend and say, come and sit with me. Ask me the question. Who do I really treasure? What, what's in my gain column? Is it years of ministry? Is it well, I did a hundred preachers? I've been on all these trips or I've planted churches? Is it that I've had these quiet times so faithfully or I've witnessed to a thousand people? What's in my gain column? Ask the question, friend. Ask the question. We can't mess around with this anymore. Jesus is that real. Jesus is always enough. And he is the one that, that died for us. You know, before the foundation of the world was formed, God says that he chose you in Christ. Jesus is the one that went to the cross for you and took all of your sin and wretchedness, all your self-righteousness, all your disgustingness. He took it all. And with it, he took all the wrath of God. He took it all so that you could be made right with God. And that God's favor and grace is towards you now. Jesus is the one, friend. The only one who will be able to comfort you truly. When you sit those lonely nights, agonizing over sorrow, agonizing over your sin, agonizing over tragedy. He's the one that will comfort you. Jesus is the one that will cause you to laugh again. When you just, when you've seen yourself. And you've seen what a wretched man you are. But just, he comes with his mercy and his grace. He says, I'm. Oh, I'm going to walk with you and I'm going to change you. I'm going to make you new and I'm going to help you know a deep joy. I'm going to help you know true satisfaction and true assurance. Friends, Jesus is so real. Let today be the day you start or let it be the day that you are encouraged to continue to get to know the person and the worth and the infinite and eternal value of Jesus Christ. We are not like them, friends. We are not like those who, who have all these badges of honors and the self-righteousness and this legalism and these religions and put their confidence in all the things that they do in their reputation. No, we are those who glory in Christ alone. Turn back to God, church. That's our only response to this text. It's our only response to the warning that Paul has given. It's our only response to the truth that Jesus Christ is always enough, is repent. Repent, church. All of us. All of us. Pastor, elder, priesthood, all of us. Church, repent. Fall on your knees before God today and say, Jesus, forgive me, for I've not valued you the way I should. You know, the first time I wrote this out, and I was sitting at my desk, and I just, I just started weeping. And I took my glass off and I went inside of my bed and I just, I wept before Christ. I said, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for how much you have changed me. Thank you that I am seeing you now, Jesus, and valuing you now, Jesus. But still, it's still so tempting. There's still so much that I've still got messed up here, Jesus. Please help me. Help me to see you more. Help me to value you more. Help me to have this assurance and this joy that surpasses all understanding. Help the, the works and the preaching, all of it, to be evidence, but not my badge of honor. Help all of our works, Jesus, to be evidence that we are so satisfied in Jesus. Our oh, church, I'm jealous for your joy this morning. This is good news, church. This is good news because it doesn't matter where you are this morning. It doesn't matter whether you're the worst of men and you are so far from God. It doesn't matter whether you are that, that kind of legalistic, self-righteous person. And I'm just, God has been shattering your framework this morning. Come to Jesus, fall on your knees and say, God, forgive me and restore me and make it real.
You know, friends, often we won't understand everything that is being said. It's going to take us an eternity to fathom the depths of all that God has put in His Word. But ask God this morning to help you experience His love. To just begin to taste of His joy. Lose yourself, friends. Die to yourself. Lose yourself completely. And find all of yourself in Christ. He is enough for you. He is enough for you to satisfy every longing and desire. To give you joy that you've ever desired. He is enough for you, church. Give up your rights as Paul did. Give up your, your dreams, your desires. Give it up all, friends. To say, Jesus, I want them more. I want you, Jesus Christ, and the life that is lived that will flow out of that, friends. Whether you see the fruit or not, will bring glory to God and will last for eternity. Church, I can't do this for you. I can't do this for my beautiful young children. I can't do this for my wife. I can't do this for you. And your parents can't do it for you, teenager, young adult. The elders can't do it for you. Paul couldn't do it for them. But he chose to just tell them the truth. He chose to tell them the truth and to bear some of his own scars on this journey. He Later on in this chapter, he goes on to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not there yet, but I'm pressing on. And friends, I've just hopefully tried to bear some of my own scars for you on my journey, my path that I'm walking. To hopefully encourage you to press on. Just start somewhere. And press on. Keep moving. Move Godward. Move towards Jesus, friends. The church repents. Come before God this morning. And He will meet you there. So can I just pray for us and then, and then we're done. God, I thank you that you are so real, Jesus. Jesus, I thank you that you've been present with me this morning, God, and you'll be present with every single person listening this morning to this preach, Jesus. And everyone who would listen to it after that, God. God, I pray that just you would take your word and what you have said is that your word, it's a, it's a two-edged sword and it discerns. It cuts the vibes and it discerns the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. It exposes our motives. It exposes us before you, God. And I pray that you would do that this morning in us, God. That you would continue to do it in me, God. And that, Lord, uh, we would be a people, God, who fully receive all that you are doing, God. You are the one at work in us, God. And you are the one continuing to work, Lord. So help us to just wait on you, God. Help us to just be a part of what you are doing. Help us, God, to walk in all that you have prepared for. With our hearts, Lord, with our hearts desperately desiring to know you more, Jesus, forgive us as a local church, as, as the people of Glen Eden Church, forgive us when we have not valued you, Jesus, when we have valued our programs or our services or our meetings or, or our disciplines or whatever it may be more than you, Jesus Christ. Forgive us when we have not held you up, Jesus, more than we have held up formulas or strategies. Forgive us, God. When we've encouraged each other towards giftings or towards works, more than we've encouraged each other towards Jesus. God, I pray that you would give us the faith, God, to just run so hard after you, to throw off everything that may hinder us, God, and just to press on and to run after you, Jesus Christ, to take fully hold of you, Jesus. And as we do that, God, you will change us. And mature us and grow us. And we'll just find ourselves, I know God, we'll just find ourselves a part of what you are doing in your fields, God. Helping and serving and loving, God. But oh Jesus, keep us safe. This word was written by Paul to keep them safe. Make us a people so secure, God. Make us a people, Jesus, who are so satisfied and glad in you, God. Help us to rejoice again, God. And you to take joy in the God of our salvation in spite of anything going on, God. And in spite of any works that we may be involved in or have done, God. You, God, we take joy in the God of our salvation in you, Jesus. God, this is only the start for many. This is an encouragement to continue for so many others. I pray, God, in our faith. 
that the work you have begun, the work you are doing, you are carrying it on, Lord. Jesus, thank you for how you love us. Thank you for how you real you are. Thank you for your mercy to me and to everyone, God, listening to this, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Oh, Phil, thank you for that word. Just listening to it again has just moved my heart to just say, God, I want so much more of you. And so church, let's respond now as this final song is played. Let's respond and say, God, we want more of you. We want you to be glorified through our lives. We want less of us and more of you in this community, the city, the nations of the world. We want to be the hands and feet of Christ. May your love radically transform our hearts. And so as was prayed now, we, we trust that this, this moment will be a moment where we just come before our great Father. And let his love and his mercy continue to transform us to be the people he wants us to be. Friends, once we've finished, I want to invite you, don't rush off. Maybe you needed to spend some alone time with God. Maybe journaling. Maybe going through the scriptures that were read today. Just continually let him wash you with his mercy and his grace. Have a wonderful day. God bless, church. Bye-bye.